Lead me astray, oh take me away to places so strange and lovely. Be on the cloud and into the blue, so lovely. Embrace this weary soul, roam free and with the breeze. Another road trip, this time through magnificent Central Australia, the Red Centre. No Bluey the Red Car this time though. We flew to Alice Springs, hired a car for a 650 kilometre road trip, driving first through the West Macdonald Ranges. The Macdonald Ranges are a beautiful range of mountains and they weave right across Central Australia, 650 kilometres or something long. They were formed over many, many millions of years, of course, by all sorts of things, erosion, water, wind. The indigenous people, the Arunta people of the area, in their dreaming they talk about a giant caterpillar weaving its way across the land and creating the peaks and valleys of the McDonald Ranges. Our first stop, we actually drove from Alice nearly to the end of the Western McDonald Ranges down to Ormiston Gorge. Spectacular, huge red cliffs that have been really worn away over the years. Now at the bottom of this is a waterhole and it can get up to about 14 metres deep and quite a haven for bird life and flora, fauna. Ancient ochre pits in one of the national parks. Fascinating. Layers of multicoloured rock considered by the local people to be some of the best ochre around. Soft with a range of incredibly vivid colours. This ochre was used in ceremonies for 40,000 years. It played a really important part in the economy of ancient Australia and was traded between neighbouring clans and Aboriginal nations right across the country. As we were wandering through the Western Macdonald Ranges, we realised that with every road trip, we've had a movie tribute. So before we forget about it, here it is. Oh, I'm just so glad I've got this knife. You know how much I love this knife. David, that's not a knife. That's a knife. Now we headed southwest and we found ourselves in Namajira country. Albert Namajira, the indigenous painter, was born and lived here. Albert's watercolours made him very famous in the 1940s and the 1950s. Everyone loved them. At Ormiston Gorge I'd taken this photograph and as soon as I saw it, it really reminded one of his paintings. When we got back to Melbourne, we found that the NGV had an exhibition of Namajira. After he died in the 1950s, his work fell out of favour. The experts thought that he was overly influenced by European art. Later, in recent years, he's been completely reassessed. Suddenly, people think that his paintings are really valuable because they show his own interpretation of the totemic, of the sacred sites and everything else. 
whatever else Namajira was a master of colour. I have always loved the colour of this country. The vibrant colours, they just rival the palettes of almost any other part of the world, I think. There's the obvious, the red sand and the blue sky, but it's the subtle greens and greys and grasses of the bushes, and even black here and there where things have been burnt. Unbelievably beautiful. We stopped along the way to get some drone shots. We both love the aerials you can get from a drone, but as much as anything, I think Carl just loved to have a play with the drone. We drove on, heading for Hermannsburg. This is where German missionaries started a Lutheran mission in about 1877. Believe it or not, they came from the Barossa Valley, about 900 k's away. And they walked up, they had dogs, they had chickens, horses, cattle, and incredibly about 2,000 sheep. The Iranda people sat and watched the mission being set up, apparently quite curious. Eventually, most of them were baptised, becoming Lutheran Christians. The missionaries were really keen. They published a dictionary and a guide to Christian practices for the locals. The secular mission was everything for them through. The school began educating the local children and they actually used the local Aranta language, which the German missionaries had learned quite quickly. Look at the writing on the blackboard, translated into their language. I have to say the desire to bring Christianity to the world and to Central Australia, to these people that have been living with their own beliefs for tens of thousands of years, a little bit bizarre, to be honest. We were warned that these roads were pretty difficult and that we needed a four-wheel drive. I was pretty happy about that. I especially love the ups and downs, the dips. Yippee! <laughs> When you come out of the unbelievably heavy traffic we have in Melbourne now, to suddenly find yourself in the desert is the biggest contrast you could ever imagine. I mean, you're standing there and there's nothing on the horizon, just this open place. There is this sense of age, of time, and there are places that I would not want to be by myself. Whether that relates back to Dreamtime stories, who knows? People always talk about the spirituality and the mysticism of deserts. And I wonder why, what's that all about? I mean, I think it's very like when you go to a great cathedral and see this extraordinary building or you see some superb art or even music. Or is it that deserts have been the cradles of our civilizations? North Africa, Middle East, Egypt, and somehow we've got it in our DNA. I watched Carl go up what they call Heartbreak Hill, a really steep climb to the top of Kings Canyon. I decided to stay behind because there was too much climbing, but there was a beautiful walk along the Kings Canyon Creek, I think it was, and it was just lovely. I did that while the car was up the top. The walk up, I have to say, that initial walk was pretty hard. 
But once you got up the top, you have these amazing views of the canyon itself and the surrounding region. Kings Canyon is about 440 million years old, so pretty ancient in the time when there was a huge abundance of sandstone deposited in the area. 40 million years ago, the valley started to be eroded by glaciers carving through. Obviously, this was an ice age. The canyon itself was named by Ernest Giles in 1872, and I quote, it is named after an old and dear friend of mine, Mr. Fielder King. Unfortunately, he didn't name it after the local indigenous name for the canyon itself, which is Wataka, the umbrella bush which grows in the region. Part of the rimwalk is going down into this place called Garden of Eden. This is a permanent water hole and it has a lot of rare plants and bird species, which is why they call it a living museum. At the end of the walk, it took me a good, uh, I think it was five or, five or six hours. Caught up with David again and we were off. Are you looking forward to your first glimpse of Uluru? I can't wait! As we continued driving south towards the rock, we stopped to photograph Mount Connor. Uluru is so well known that this mesa, massive flat top mountain, is often ignored by people. Good. Uh, it's probably about 500 million years old. In the Dreamtime stories, Mount Connor is connected with the Ninja, the feared Ninja, the ancient ice men of cold weather. Big. Nothing quite prepares you for that first sight of Uluru. It's unforgettable, much larger than I was expecting to see. It's estimated that you only see the top part of the rock and about two thirds of it below the surface. Millions of years ago, it was underwater, so it was under sea, inland sea. And what's happened over time is that with upheaval and all these things, it's turned onto its side. The Anangu people's story say that the rock was made in the earliest dream time and it's seen as an extraordinary feat of creation. As you go in close, you'll see these amazing rock paintings that have obviously been painted over thousands of years. In 1988, I made a documentary about this whole Central Australian area with Michael Looning, the cartoonist, and he found on the wall of this cave a drawing that reminded him of his little man figure. And then this time, I found that figure again. I read somewhere that this ancient art is like someone putting all this stuff on a blackboard and then everyone leaves the room and only the teacher and the students who are in that room will ever know what it meant. It's really a hidden lesson from the ancient past. Mutajulu waterhole is one of the few permanent water sources around the base of Uluru. It has the most amazing creation story related to it. It's about this deadly battle between, I think her name's Kaniya, 
uh, the python woman and Liru, the poisonous brown snake man. Um, and you can almost feel that sense when you're sitting around the waterhole itself. The early Australian explorers described these huge areas in Central Australia as being characterised by gravel, desert grasses and undulating dunes. Much of Central Australia is made of sand dunes. Ancient dunes lined up one after another. I'm sure many people have lost their way in these dunes over the years. It would be very easy to do. My once excellent sense of direction has aged, so I need to be careful. I can't, I can't. Second. Uluru. We lost, a bit lost where we are. It's that way, isn't it? No, no. Uluru. That way, and Katajuta's that way. Smart ass. I decided to do a helicopter flight. I like to see things from the air. David stayed on the ground. He's seen all of these things in his filming trips. The higher you go, the different perspective you get of the rock. And you see how immense it is from the air. From a little bit of flying around Uluru, we flew across to Katajuta. Now, there are so many domes that make up Katajuta itself. I was in awe of this rock formation. I've often wondered about that idea that a lot of Indigenous paintings are taken from a bird's eye view. And I always wonder how they manage to get that perspective. And as you go high, it takes on a different viewpoint and you see what they're using their symbols for in their painting. So, Katajuta. There are actually 36 domed rock formations. The original Pichinchanchara name means many heads. The Dreamtime legend talks of another snake king, Wanambi, who lives on the highest dome in Katajuta. Apparently, he would come down only during the summertime, during the dry season, and could turn a breeze into a hurricane and would often punish those who did evil things. Again, I let Carl do the long walk and I hung around just to have a good look at the place. Unlike the big single rock which makes up Uluru, the domes of Katajuta are composed of a conglomerate, including granite, pieces of basalt, all held together in a matrix of sandstone. Valley of the Winds is a walk that goes through the domes of Katajuta, a very tranquil place, beautiful and serene. Apparently, the rocks of Katajuta contain an enormous spirit energy. Uh, since 1995, the local indigenous have returned to using this as a ceremonial site. The next day we were very excited. Uluru in the rain. Everyone wants to see Uluru like this. We felt so lucky. 
What it does is it changes the colours of the rock itself, so it goes to this silvery grey rather than the reds. The rain allows the desert to basically thrive and bloom. It brings the desert to life and life goes on. When you go to a place like Central Australia and you witness the isolation, you witness the harshness of the land, then you think about it and go, hang on a sec, people have been living here for 60 to 70,000 years. That's phenomenal. Well, I feel pretty strongly that we owe the Indigenous people of Australia a lot. And I'm very grateful and privileged that we can actually walk on their land. Central Australia is red. It's not called the Red Centre for, for nothing. It is really, really quite red. So in the rocks, in the sand, everywhere. At the same time, the isolation that you feel, that's something to witness yourself. And I'd challenge anyone to, to go out there and, and, uh, and not enjoy it. It's a place of peace and quiet. Very little happening, but of course, you look down and there's lizards and there's flowers to look at. It's just the most extraordinary experience. Actually, 36 domes. You just said domes. Say it, say it. There are actually 36 large domes. There are. Dream time story. <laughs> no red car this time, though. No red car. No blue in the red car. Mm -hmm. No red car this time, though. No bluey the red car this time, though. We flew to Central Australia. Fuck. Uh, one more. It's really quite breathtaking. Is that all right? Unbelievably beautiful. I can't do it, Carl. You can. We were all... <laughs> we were warm. We were warm. Would you ever get bored? It's the same old colours everywhere you go. I would get bored shitless. So, Carl, hang on, hang on. Uluru is back behind us, isn't it? It's that way, isn't it? No. I'm not sure. <laughs> is it that way? Which way? That way. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 